you're missing a source of a pathogen in a partner who's suffering and whose quality of life is impacted. Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Melissa, and today at Live UTI Free, we have part two of our follow up interview with Dr. Tim Levinka. In part one, we discuss hormonal imbalances pre menopause and the possible link to UTI. Here in part two, we're discussing how UTI causing organisms can pass between partners during sexual activity and what to do about it. If you haven't seen our first interview with Dr. Tim Levinka on UTIs after sex, be sure to check it out. If you enjoy these videos, think they're important, and want to support what we do, be sure to hit subscribe and tick the bell so you'll be notified of future content. Thanks again for joining us on this journey to making change in women's health. I know you've mm -hmm. been doing a lot of research since we last spoke, so it would be great to get an update about your research mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what you're finding in terms of what organisms are being transferred between partners mm -hmm. during sexual activity. Mm -hmm. So um, this has changed, and I, I, I must say uh, it's one of, the, <coughs> one of the things that, and again, I'm going to plug um, the Microgen DX, the uh, uh, really the only effective commercially uh, reliable uh, next generation sequencing lab out there. Uh, they have been so instrumental um, in my being able to develop the experience that I have. Mm -hmm. And I would say expertise, but I'll leave that up to you uh, as the followers. Uh, but it, the experience has definitely been critical in determining whether or not um, there is an organism there. Mm -hmm. I thought, uh, and this is, I'm going to speak both broadly as well as the cohort of patients that are our couples uh, infections. Uh, we're now up to 96. We're doing the research and looking uh, at the data on uh, couples, and we have 96. Uh, we do have um, through four gay male uh, couples uh, and, and two uh, gay female couples in there. So. Not a big database, but certainly something that I think is important because mm -hmm. of partnering issues uh, to get some science out there uh, for everybody that might be yeah. suffering from this. Um, and again, so many times I hear, well, that just doesn't happen. Okay, well, you know, you can remain ignorant as long as you want, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And I give the analogy, and maybe I said this last time, Melissa, but I, I tell providers and patients uh, alike, it's like, well, you can get strep throat from kissing somebody. So why shouldn't you get a UTI from any kind of sexual activity? And the first thing that we saw at the beginning of noticing uh, this phenomenon was that there was a lot more oral organisms uh, that were causing these chronic UTIs and beta strep, as I think I told you before, beta hemolytic strep was one that was very, very common. Typically, that's just a few percent of UTIs in women, and it was 15 to 30 percent, um, depending on the risk factors and the uh, demographic pre or postmenopausal uh, patient population. So that was something that's come. But as we treated patients more and kept them from since the three or four years since we've talked, um, the microbes are smart. They've, they've had that microbial drift and it's become different. So we are seeing some more unusual organisms. I'll wait to publish the paper, but you'll be the first to know uh, what those data are. But we're seeing microbial drift, and with the more treatment and keeping the patients chronically for several years now, now we're seeing a completely new crop of organisms that's showing up. And the, the enterococcus continues to be an issue uh, refractory uh, in refractory patients, um, resistant uh, coliforms, um, but some newer organisms are emerging um, that, that are somewhat bothersome. And mm -hmm. it's obvious that the, the pressure on the microbial population from the chronic antibiotic use uh, is what's uh, causing this to emerge. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll update that when we have that. There's definitely Do you have a timeline on when you might publish that data? Well, my research person, uh, I need to hear from him pretty soon because uh, I know the microgen people were, were bugging me to have something at least to to present like at a, at just a, um, just an FYI, like we, when you, 
there's like news at these medical meetings. There's news. Some, if something's really hot, you don't have to have it published or anything like that. If there's something really critical for patient information, uh, and I was hoping to have that by next week when I when I go to the uh, to the women's health meeting, um, I might not have that. The, the, okay. the researcher has had other things to do, um, and I think, quite frankly, they get paid more by the other people. What can I say? <laughs> Well, you will have it's to women's know. health, Melissa. Yeah, it's women's health, yes, of course. We're they. very familiar with that problem. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Still on the topic of organisms, though, we do mm -hmm. often get questions about urea plasma and mm -hmm. whether it mm -hmm. should be something that is always treated when it shows up in either partner or in both partners. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we are all subject to our own biases. There's confirmation bias. And no matter if you're human, you have confirmation bias. Uh, I think it's part of being human. Uh, and as providers, we suffer from the same thing. Um, and I don't think it's because the first patient, the index patient for me, for whom uh, the next generation sequencing solved a very refractory tenacious problem, for whom this patient had seen lots of um, providers and was suffering a great deal. I did an exam. I did a urethral massage, which is now my, because um, she had a little bit of discharge, which is now my kind of uh, protocol and I saw the discharge, I swabbed it with a microgen and she had urea plasma. I gave her two weeks of doxycycline and she thinks I'm a hero. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the kind of thing that transforms your thinking. But I really do suspect that urea plasma because of its potential to harbor, to stay as a harbor and periurethral glands in both men and women and the prostate in men, I, I treat it. And even if one partner has it, for instance, I saw a patient just yesterday and she had urea plasma, and her partner had never had it. But I said, you can't, if, if you've had it twice, that means he's got it and he's given it back to you. And she indeed had had it twice. So I, I pretty much treat urea plasma as one of those that almost universally uh, potentially is infecting the other uh, partner um, and needs to be treated. Okay. That's good to know. And if someone is experiencing UTIs after sex only with a specific partner, is that a good indication that partner may be transferring UTI causing organisms? Those circumstances are too easy for us now. We, we know to test that partner right away. Um, that, that's an easy one. And even as I'll, I think I mentioned before, but I'll get into it in more detail. E even if they're using a condom, we have found that sometimes it's carrying or groin, in inguinal fold, uh, it can be bacteria can live there. About 10% of our patients will continue to get UTIs with condom use, uh, and we are much more aggressive in swabbing areas and, and looking for potential sources of the pathogens. Um, and I also no longer, again, I was first starting to treat couples um, for this, I, it was mandatory that the couple had the same organism and I treated them accordingly. As I saw, no, they, they can have two or three and only two of them be the same or one the same. And then I saw that sometimes none of them were the same, but treatment still was necessary. So I think there is something pro-inflammatory about say, for instance, the semen or the genital tissues and say, let's just say, for instance, the male partner who may be asymptomatic and be the carrier of these pathogens. So even if they have different organisms, if they have pathogens, I treat them out mm -hmm. because I have found that they will continue to produce the same UTI organisms in their partners, even if they're different organisms. And that is something that I really can't get any of my colleagues to understand, but it's just so paramount in my evaluation now it's like it's a pro-inflammatory state if you're having sexual activity related infections it's caused by the act of sexual activity mm -hmm. got to look for what you can treat and sometimes those are going to be disparate microorganisms in the two members of the couple and no longer do they need to have parallel organisms for me to treat no no way yeah. I, I would miss so many infections that's very interesting. It kind of complicates it, though, to change the way that things are done. It just kind of means we have to be very suspicious about partners and test them and be willing to treat them if we want to help women get over these infections. And I will say, just to, to, to 
back up my guys a little bit. The guys have been very good. It's very, very rare that a guy has been reluctant um, to test because, um, I mean, they're, they, they want to be able to continue to have sexual activity and they, they certainly understand that if their partners are suffering, that that's just not, um, not in the cards. Um, so, I mean, and, and if not, I'll pick up the phone and give them a piece of my mind, guy to guy, you know, so I've yeah. done that many times, so. You mentioned oral sex briefly. Uh, is there, mm -hmm. can you transfer organisms that might cause UTI during any kind of sexual activity, regardless Absolutely. of penetration? It, it, even if you're, even if you're making out and uh, driving on a country road and you get in the backseat and start making out and groping, you know, it, it's, and that's why I see some of the young teenagers come in where their parents say, there's no way they could have be getting these and from each other. So, yeah, well, yeah, they can. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, even just from manual contact, because we have seen that, uh, that somebody says, well, we didn't even have sex that time. We were just sort of fooling around mm -hmm. uh, and they, they got the infection. Well, yeah, that can be sort of an oral manual type uh, uh transformation i should say mm -hmm. and it seems so obvious that organisms are transferred back and forth during sexual activity mm -hmm. so why is there still this widely held opinion that utis are not sexually transmitted how is it different from trichomoniasis or hpv or any other sti how is it different from strep throat or uh, upper viral upper respiratory illnesses i i don't know melissa i'm one of the frustrations with my colleagues not being able to see what i see so obviously um I don't even think it, you have to do next generation sequencing. I think you just have to be a um, astute clinician and realize that if a mode of transmissibility is probable, then it's likely. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of concern around STI testing among the UTI mm -hmm. community because of the knowledge of how unreliable standard urine culture is. And mm -hmm. now there's questions around whether STI testing has the same problem. Is it as unreliable? Well, I will say for the PCR component, for again, PCR technology, everybody's familiar with that after COVID PCR testing. Um, but the, the bottom line is it's definitely an upgrade from traditional cultures, no doubt about that. Uh, but ev all of these panels are limited. They're, they're set up economically because you want to get the most probable uh, uh, agents that are causing the potential uh, disease, infection, symptoms, whatever you be, you're looking for. And, and so to do that, you have to set these up because the FDA here in the U.S. won't approve a test unless it's got bona fide research behind it. So you're getting these combinations through the FDA is very difficult um, at, the, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it behooves the manufacturers, producers, distributors to, to limit that. That doesn't behoove the patient or the provider because then you're narrowing the spectrum. Over time, now after 6,000 microgens and 3,000 patients, our false negative for the PCR component of the microgen, which is just the, is the PCR alone, is still hovering at 35 to 40%, not much. Mm -hmm. um, and the false negative for the next generation um, is about um, 8% or okay. when you wait for the next generation sequencing to come out. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I don't trust PCRs. I don't trust PCRs. So how does someone know, given the overlap in symptoms, when to test for UTI versus STI? I think it's the type of contact that's important. If it's a mon monogamous partner um, and there has not been uh, any sort of variance in partners, you can just do UTI testing. If there has been any potential for that, then it's probably more prudent to do STI testing. Okay. And another question about testing in these scenarios, you're saying that the organisms could be transferred from anywhere on the body. How do you test each partner for different areas that might be contributing to this problem? And can you explain that in terms of female and male biology? So I, I used to be more broad and, and honestly, this was in order to get the paper published where I knew I had to swab the, the groins of men and women. Mm -hmm. I do a vaginal deep and superficial vaginal and males and the semen and urine and growing swab in the, in the guys. Um, so in order to get my first paper published, uh, the 35 patients, I knew I needed to do that. But pretty much even before I accumulated that data, I knew that it was the 
the 10 percent as i said before that and those are typically the ones that still get them after condom use uh, where you need to look for other sources now do i swab them out no because i'm not really capable of or the nares or something no i don't i don't i stick to the below the stuff because i really don't know how to interpret if i do a mouth swab now, if it's a typical oral organism, well, yeah, then we'll maybe do that to see if there's a harbor. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, see if they could gargle and get rid of that pathogen. You know? if, or, you know, can I, I, I have a lot of patients, I tell them to gargle three times a day, and that's taking care of the beta hemolytic strep that they've been causing their partner to have mm -hmm. an infection with. Uh, so I tend to kind of be more specific about those and, and see if I can prove that there's a traditional source causing the infection. What type of testing do you use to monitor vaginal health? I have found that the EVI test, which is EVVY, uh, available here in the United States, uh, it is getting more and more traction among women's health providers. Uh, a lot of the functional medicine docs, a lot of gynecologists, particularly those that treat chronic uh, vaginitis, um, are on board. It does so much more. You get a next generation sequencing of the vaginal uh, biome, mm -hmm. uh, both pathogens and normal. Uh, and you also get many, many more chemical um, uh, uh, parameters studied that can be important. It goes well beyond pH. I think they measure the pH of so the 0 0.1, um, 0.01, as opposed to what you typically with the mm -hmm. dipsticks can get. Um, there, there is a vaginal health index that they do from that, uh, which sort of looks at for a given hormonal, uh, environment in a woman, what, what's happening, uh, with the vaginal epithelium, which is critical. Um, so the EBI test has been, been very helpful in my patients to Great. know can, what's there. Yeah. We can drop a link for that in the description for the video as well. Okay. Can semen testing identify a pathogenic reservoir in the prostate? Absolutely, 100%. I, I won't, I typically, and there are a few patients that can't ejaculate in order to produce a semen specimen. Typically, they've had prostate surgery or they have on medications that make ejaculation problematic. Um, the, the, those, and those patients will all do a prostate massage and have them void in a cup and send out. Some providers think that's just as good. No, it's not. Guarantee it's not. Um, so the best thing is a, is a semen specimen, a urine specimen, and a groin specimen. That gives me the most information. Mm -hmm. But I, I've seen enough, about 30% of the time, there's a, the urine has a pathogen that the semen doesn't. Um, and that's why I insist on both in the guys. If I only can get one, I prefer a semen. But mm -hmm. you can always get a urine. It's, prob it's yeah. getting the semen. That's the problem. Well, then how do you address the chronic prostate infection given treatments don't tend to penetrate that organ very well? I depend if they're asymptomatic, it becomes a bit more of a problem. I think I, I, I honestly triage uh, the female partner. Uh, and if she's getting really sick and quality of life is impacted, then he needs to get full blown aggressive chronic prostatitis treat, uh, treatment like he came in with a, you know, really acute episode. Well, that would be acute prostatitis, but, but you know, where he's really got a bad episode that needs to be treated with six weeks of antibiotics. That's what we're going to have to do to give any chance. So if she's really getting volatile symptoms from sexual activity and there are clear pathogens in the male, I treat more aggressively. But most of the time I try to do an appropriate course of antibiotics. And by the way, nobody should be giving you these one day, three day, five day, seven day. If you have refractory UTIs, please, 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 please tell your providers that's not enough. I need more, mm -hmm. or at least give me a refill. So I don't start, and again, I'm seeing a very specialized population, but I don't give anybody less than 10 days, and most of the time it's two weeks of therapy. Mm -hmm. the and the guys, if they're totally symptomatic and I feel like there's kind of an easy to eradicate pathogen, and she's got that pathogen, I may give them 10 days just because I don't want the antibiotic side effects uh, to occur in somebody who's asymptomatic. I will tell you that's the reason why a lot of my colleagues have not adopted this, but you know, too bad. You're, you're missing a source of a pathogen in a partner who's suffering and whose quality of life is impacted. So you got to go and say, hey, you got that organism, you need to be treated. And again, if she's more virulent, 
the male partner is treated more aggressively. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to finishing a long-term course of antibiotics and what's a good indicator of when it's the right time to do that, to come off the antibiotics and how can you recover from any side effects you might've experienced? I think it depends on the patient and what their um, course has been. Those that get really sick really quick, as I say, um, they're reluctant and you have to be much more cautious about doing that. Um, we try to boost everything, the immune system, make sure that the immune system boosters, prebiotics, probiotics, you know, try to make sure that the normal flora has been reestablished as much as possible. And then we slowly wean off. And some it's, if they're on daily antibiotics, it's go three times a week and twice a week and once a week and stop. Mm -hmm. uh, others just switch to something like hip rex as they come off the antibiotics and then wean off the hip rex if they can. Um, those are typically the way uh, that we wean patients off chronic antibiotics. But again, if they get really sick right away, you're going to have to be much more cautious in that time course is mm -hmm. so long. I would say probably about three months in the most severe cases. Uh, you can do it in a few weeks in patients for whom the infections have been infrequent, but but, but se severe. Mm -hmm. Do you see patients able to come off long-term antibiotics and not get UTIs again? Yes, because I want to give hope out there when hope can be given. Uh, false hope is not good, but but true hope is good. Um, it, it leads to determination. When we know that there's hope, we become more determined. And that's what I will tell you that, yes, there's most patients can be. Um, again, I'm seeing a patient population for whom that's not the case. They're just again and again and again. But I have to feel like I made a difference in their lives after doing this for seven years. And um, and, and sometimes I think you only remember the failures mm -hmm. and I think it's important for us to recognize that, you know, if, if I can improve, I try to focus on quality of life and by all intent, for all intents and purposes, that's an individual decision of a woman to tell me. I don't get to say whether or not the quality of life has been improved. EDTA is often touted as a biofilm buster along with other ingredients. What's the latest research on this and what's your approach to biofilms? As that has evolved certainly a lot since we've been uh, last talking. Um, the whole notion of embedded infections being a controversy it is absurd. It just has to go out the window. If you haven't and you treat appropriately based on all the diagnostic and therapeutic data that you have. And I would say without a microgen, you haven't, quite honestly. Um, but if you've done that and if the pathogen reemerges or a second path pathogen emerges because of treating that one, then you've got an embedded infection. And I'm convinced that these are microscopic because I did endoscopies, the cystoscopies on many of the first patients that came in to me, but I realized that that was just punitive to them because it didn't matter. If I, it was very rare that I saw something. Uh, a lot of the IC patients did have an ulcer um, or lesions that I biopsied, and in half of them I found a biofilm, but in the other half I didn't, but they acted like they did. So I quit doing that. I thought that was horribly invasive, but mm -hmm. it's just, the, it's the it's what happens to us when we're doing something new that we feel like we've got to get it right. Um, and, but very quickly, I realized how overly invasive that was and horrible to suggest to a patient that's what I was going to have to do. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, when you get a biopsy, you're going to burn it with the laser. It's going to make you miserable and subject you to a lower uh, infection threshold because you've altered the tissue. So, But biofilms are there. I treat every patient who becomes refractory, if I can't, if I treat with two or three courses of antibiotics and they don't respond with either the same or newer organism, newer pathogens, then I treat them as having biofilm and I um, treat them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Our approach to biofilm is got an EDTA, uh, an antibiotic, typically what there are several antibiotics that have been shown to penetrate um, the biofilm. However, they need to be taken high dose and long term. Azithromycin is one, erythromycin is another, doxycycline, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, those are ones. 
most of the time I like to stay with the simplest agent and that's azithromycin, mm -hmm. uh, given 500 milligrams. Uh, and I typically give that for two weeks before I start the others, just to give the antibiotic a little time to penetrate. So even though these are really lousy UTI organ um, antibiotics, uh, typically the mycins are not good for UTIs, doxycycline and Bactrim of course can be, um, but they're, they do penetrate biofilms very well. So a couple of weeks then, then a combination of, you, you need enzymatic degradation, you need to have the enzymes that are gonna go, you need EDTA and enzymatic degradation for the, for the biofilm. You need something that are proteases and things like that, they're gonna come in, proteolases is what they're actually called, because uh, that means break up the protein. So you need both. And the reason why they've been ineffective is that there haven't been formulations that have been able to get into the bladder in high enough mm -hmm. concentrations because they're not absorbed through the gut. Mm -hmm. um, so the liposomal and the functional, again, the functional medicine doctor is so good about this, the liposomal formulations of those are much better because then you've got the concoction of the EDTA and the enzymes that are not gonna be chewed up by your stomach acid. They're gonna get into the bloodstream and into your bladder in decent concentrations to work. Mm -hmm. So you can get that at least started. So two weeks of azithromycin, then start that. I tell patients if they're not willing to do all of this for three months, then don't start it because it's not gonna help them. Many patients, it's six months, a year, and many patients they have to stay on it. So that's why giving more antibiotics up front more often, more courses, it, what, what are you going to commit to? Taking three things for six months or, you know, one thing for a couple of weeks at a time. So we, we, we yeah. sort of do the math and look at each in the, uh, indication that way. Um, but, but that's kind of how I do biofilm disruption now. Is there a particular biofilm disruptor that you use or is this something that you compound? Uh, I think biofilm defense plus is, is a good one. Again, most of the time, it's probably a better idea to go to a functional medicine doc and see who their supplier is because they do have the liposomal ones. Those can be expensive, but quite honestly, it's completely different efficacy in mm -hmm. the patients that I've seen. And after all of this treatment, is it possible to restore a healthy microbiome in the vagina or the bladder? Um, so in so much as that we're looking at what the normal uh, vaginal and bladder microbiome is. Um, and I think that that data should be published by Microgen here pretty soon. I know I've talked to the CEO and I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's in, I think they've submitted it and it's being uh, looked at by a journal right now. Um, so I don't want to be premature about disclosing that, but the, the bottom line is that is being looked at and see what the normal is first. Um, I will say that it's a struggle for many patients that we send these nuclear bombs into your your intestine and your vagina mm -hmm. and create these horrific changes in the ecosystem uh, that is a finely tuned human body. Um, when one, uh, I was listening to one functional medicine lecture the other day, and I, I didn't realize it, but there's over a trillion uh, microorganisms in our intestine. So when I give you 20 billion twice a day to prevent your, as a probiotic, well, I mean, come on, look at what I'm doing from a standpoint mm -hmm. of impacting that. Um, the vagina doesn't have that um, much, uh, but still the bottom line is these are profound alterations in a very well-balanced ecosystem that have multiple parameters in terms of pH, uh, flora, uh, epithelial changes, and pro-inflammatory agents. It, it just, it, most of what we do just sits a nuclear bomb off in a woman's mm -hmm. vagina. And so it's very critical to be proactive about that. And that's, I try to do that as much as possible. Most of my patients now I'm seeing, oh, Melissa, quite honestly, they've had so much treatment for so long, it's gonna be very difficult. They'll be very refractory to restoring that. And it can mm -hmm. take months and months and may never, may never happen. But typically, I do the prebiotics, probiotics. I do um, hyaluronic acid, um, the commercially available products over the counter, like Refresh and Replens. I think the more you can do to kind of recreate the ecosystem like it should be, the faster the patients are going to respond. But without hormones, it, it can be next mm -hmm. to impossible.
you talk a little bit about the hyaluronic acid and how you use that? Uh, most patients are able to tolerate that very well. Uh, typically, it's in a form of a suppository. There's several commercial um, Re Reverie, I think, is one that produces it. Uh, very, very effective product. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get combinations with other um, uh, other agents uh, with the hyaluronic acid. Uh, many of these are sort of concoctions that tend to have sort of uh, emollients or uh, hypoallergenic cream to kind of diminish the inflammatory response. Um, so that's that's typically what I recommend. But again, then you start getting the thing where you're putting five things in your vagina, you know, every day, um, just just to be able to have a quality of life. Um, you know, as as a male, I, I tend to let my patients teach me what is the right thing for them uh, about how much they're willing to do. Do you think using these types of products, the hyaluronic acid or DHEA or vaginal probiotics, can help protect from organisms transferred from a partner during sexual activity? Yes, I do. In so much as that's what God gave us from the normal ecosystem, if you can, it's, the more it makes sense, the more you can recreate that or recover that, uh, the more likely you will have those protective phenomena. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of studies on that or something. It's just one of those that it makes sense. Yeah. I think. Do you have any other general advice about how to prevent UTIs after sex? Um, I think the the issue is is that hygienic, and my patients, everybody's first thing they do is be better with our hygiene. So I'm I'm that doesn't really seem to help because these are the patients that are already doing the simple things. They're they're avoiding before and after. They're they're you know making sure that they don't have um, prolonged time between a shower and have an intercourse or something like that. Uh, many times they're showering before and after. Um, they're, they're, the, the kind of basic hygiene is already done in almost all my patients. Um, and they're not really doing anything that's um, um, bothersome. You know, it's hard to tell people to give up oral sex because that's just so much fun. I, I, do, I do say that even with a condom, uh, anal, uh, penetrative, uh, sex is probably not a good idea just because it spreads so many more mm -hmm. potential pathogens from the, the rectum uh, onto the perineum. Um, and and that, that's kind of the, the main things I say for prevention. Okay. We had a couple of anatomy questions on the topic mm -hmm. as well. The first mm -hmm. was, is the size of the labia associated with susceptibility to a current UTI? <clears throat> I have not seen so. I, it, with good hygiene, I have not seen so. If are you saying that someone with sort of uh, large uh, labia, there might be issues with predispos predisposing to infections? Is that the question? I think either uh, way, the question was neutral. Mm, okay. Um, I have not seen, I've seen quality of health of the labia impacting. In other words, if uh, a large labia for which there's estrogen deficiency and a small, you know, retracted labia mm -hmm. with estrogen deficiency, I've seen that be mm -hmm. a problem mainly because there's a mechanical issue. So with both ways, there's a, yeah. with, with intercourse, it's very hard to get enough lubrication to not irritate those, those areas during yeah. intercourse. Okay. And another question about whether vaginal discharge can cause UTIs. Vaginal discharge. Um, so some vaginal discharge is normal, particularly if you're on a therapy, uh, an estrogen-based therapy or DHEA, Anything that you're going to be doing, a lot of the things we just talked about that are potentially uh, pro-hygienic um, and uh, uh, promote, promotory of restoring the normal ecosystem, there's going to be some discharge. If the discharge is copious and bothersome, then that becomes an issue. I, I, I tell the patients, if, I, if I've got to have you put up with one s sort of side effect or symptom and things are working very well and your quality of life you're happy with, that may be the one I have to ask you to put up with just because it can be a, a, a side benefit. I mean, a, a sign mm -hmm. of a successful treatment. If it's excessive, um, then most of the time I have to withdraw a therapy uh, to diminish it. And they're not necessarily willing to do that. Okay. Can you provide any advice on how to clean the urethral opening and anus in females and males? So I, I guess this is a good time to introduce uh, the TheraWorks in the United States. TheraWorks is a manufacturer. It's a it's it's a healthcare company that produces things like uh, mainly orthopedic sports medicine, um, where they 
produce like pain patches for injuries. You'll, you'll see these shoulder things, you know, if, uh, if you've hurt your shoulder and things like that. Um, but they do have a genital urinary uh, division that produces a product called Uropack, uh, like urology and package. Um, and Uropack by TheraWorks um, is, and you can get it in the U.S. Uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's got colloidal silver in a natural antiseptic. Um, it is a great product. It's something I was not using, I don't think at all, uh, last time we spoke. Uh, couldn't go so far as to say game changing, but critical addition to my, my treatment protocols. Um, and it's very safe. Again, there's no antibiotic in it. There's no, there's nothing that's sort of a chemical either than this silver and a natural antiseptic, right? Um, it is so safe that it is used in the newborn intensive care units for newborn pink eye, conjunctivitis. Um, when the rep comes into the office to sell it to you, uh, he will squirt it in his eye and show you how safe it is. So that was safe enough for Tipica to ask my patients to put it in their perineum and their vagina. Uh, and it, it comes in just like a little spray pump bottle, which has a foam um liquid and then it comes to these these wipes so the wipes are done in the perineum in this buttock whatever whatever area you need to do that um and then the pump instead of using that like to wash an area uh although if there's obvious contamination that might be good i'm having women soak a tampon uh and put that in their vagina for a couple of hours a day and for most vaginitis be it anything and backing up a little bit, those two agents, nothing grew. But it's also not very toxic. It's very well tolerated. And I have found that it just does not disrupt the microbiome nearly as much as like boric acid or any intravaginal therapies or, you know, certainly than any systemic therapy. They see a woman seems to regain the vaginal microbiome, the vaginal ecosystem uh, faster after using this. So that's the therapy I use. Another thing I think is critical, and I have to criticize one of my uh, my colleagues um, here in the U.S. who is also uh, a refractory UTI specialist, um, but he has told patients, and again, I'm going to be blunt about what I've seen that's just not working. It is not to criticize a provider. As I said at the outset, we all have different approaches to this. Uh, our confirmation bias are different, um, but this provider doesn't even look at the vagina, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't swab the vagina, doesn't treat uh, anything, only what's in the bladder is treated. Well, that's just not going to work. You're, 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 you've, I have many patients who have a vaginal source of the pathogen, and I treat with two weeks of this intravaginal therapy with this TheraWork, and it gets rid of their UTIs. Even though they're not having any vaginal symptoms, I find the harbor with next generation sequencing and I treat it, and that has been been critical in terms of altering the, the the disease process in them. And it makes sense if you can get rid of it in the vagina, that's where it's coming from. But treat that instead of taking a pill or putting this god awful stuff in there that's yeah. going to nuke everything. So that's that's kind of what I would would say is that we, we listen to what makes sense to you, and if the provider's telling you that it doesn't make, and whatever they're saying to you doesn't make sense to you. And it doesn't make sense. So find somebody who's willing to look wider. So. Okay. That's a good time to ask then how you think a patient can find a provider that has enough knowledge of this topic in order to provide the care they need. It, it's difficult because there are only a few of us and we tend to have somewhat different ways of doing it. I'm not going to pat myself on the back from the standpoint of just telling you that what, what I have spoken to you is extensive experience. And the experience has been, quite honestly, to be blunt, failure. In other words, most of what I've learned and what I'm telling you is extensively backed up by experience that has been negative. And I've had to find something else or I've had patients for whom I haven't been able to help or I've actually made worse. And so when I tell you something, there is a lot of data behind it, a lot of patient experience and outcome that, that make my recommendations as they are. And I don't know everything. I learn something every day. I learn something from you right now. You know, it. I'm not going to be so arrogant. I'm much more humble than I was four years ago when we interviewed. 
because I thought this microgen is great. I'm going to have next generation seeking. I'm going to whip your butts, bacteria, you know, and defend fungus. And yeah, well, the mi microbes have made me uh, very humble from that standpoint. Um, but th that's critical to keep an open mind about new things, new ways of looking at things, new protocols. Uh, I, I know a lot of providers across the world that are, we, I, we, we're seeing the same patients. I'm anxious to share their experiences. One of the things I've told the CEO of Microgen is that you really need to get a panel of experts and be promotional about this. You're, you're the common link, uh, as are you, Melissa, and others, to getting us professionals together to start talking. I've tried individually to talk to some of them, and it's been frustrating in mm -hmm. that we haven't really been able to reach much common ground, because I would really like to share that information with them. Yeah, but I would say your, your website and the Microgen website and the other sort of Facebook pages and things, that's the way to find it. Because then you're going to find out what the patient uh, experience has been uh, from somebody for whom it counts. Here's the other thing to kind of circle back about the fight a provider. You need a team. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, patients, you, patients want an advocate. They don't. They know we don't know it all. Uh, obviously, we don't know it all because you're talking to us because you've had all these issues. So the bottom line is if that provider does not have a pelvic floor physical therapist, uh, potentially a pain management uh, person, um, they need a network and a functional medicine doc typically or a naturopath. <clears throat> if you don't have that basic team, you're not going to be able to treat these conditions uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. Probably a good time to mention that we also can share information about clinicians with patients. So we do have a network of clinicians who have been recommended by patients in the community and sometimes by other clinicians. If there are clinicians out there that would like to find out more about that, they can get in touch with us. And patients who would like information about clinicians in the area will always do our best to provide that information. You're on that list, of course. I'm glad. It's been wonderful. I really wanted to thank you for joining us again today and answering oh, our questions. Course, anytime. Great. It's always a delight to spend time with you. And again, I'm at the beginning and the end, I'm going to absolutely tell you how important you are to all of us in the community, um, or how critical you've been to be able to make people's lives better. And we thank you for that. Thanks so much. Thanks again for watching. I hope you found part two of this follow-up interview helpful and pay particular attention to the section about UTIs as sexually transmitted infections, particularly if you experience UTIs after sex. Of course, if you like what we're doing on this channel and want to support what we do, be sure to hit subscribe and tick the bell so you'll be notified of future videos. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep asking questions and pushing for better solutions.